Good afternoon. I, in spite of the attendance requirements, appreciate your presence. And I think we are in the process of having a good experience together. Imagination in the sermon. I want to begin with a quote from my favorite book, that is, aside from the Bible, and that book is Desire of Ages. The author says, it would be well for us spend a thoughtful hour each day in contemplation of the life of Christ. We should take it point by point, she writes. And then the next sentence is key to this presentation. And let the imagination grasp each scene. especially the closing ones. As we thus dwell, and I've underlined that in my, my script, as we thus dwell upon his great sacrifice for us, then she lists three things that will happen to our benefit. One, our confidence in him will be constant. Two, our love will be quickened. Three, and we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. If I will pause, close my eyes, and see him there, dwelling upon it, the ominous, indescribable, deeply meaningful, and spiritually exciting sacrifice of Jesus. Something will happen for me if I use this gift called imagination. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why are some preachers better to listen to than others? For we established clearly this morning, it's not because of God's favoritism. If he called you, he intends to use you which means he believes in you more than you believe in yourself. But why? Why do some preachers hold us wrapped, unflinching, glued? And why do others stimulate us to nodding? I would suggest to you today that there are many reasons, but the one I'm going to focus on today is imagination expressed in language. You have been given a powerful gift. Ellen White says the most powerful of gifts given to the human mind is the gift of expression. You can talk. And you can talk with passion and with purpose and with eloquence. Hear some of you describing Michael Jordan's last move on the court in that championship game where he went right and the fellow went left and then his legs like bows bent 
and then muscles responded to a mind excited by the GABA released from the cerebral cortex and his hands pumped back and suddenly a little object called a ball went right through a cylinder called a basket and everybody cheered. Here you paint that to your friends. I just did. Here you talk about your brand new car. Here that lady described the tremendous sale where she had the dress just the way she wanted it at the price she'd always dreamed of. Hear her, and no one has to stimulate those individuals in those moments to eloquence. It pours forth from their minds. You have a gift. The gift of words. Words that can, like incisors, pierce the brain through the ears and begin to paint pictures. Every Sabbath morning, you can turn the, the, the minds of your congregation into a tapestry. And the brush in your hand is words. Powerful, well thought through words. Sometimes I may spend as much as 15 minutes on one sentence. Reshaping it. Looking at it. Turning it over. Reading it aloud until it says exactly what I wanted to say because James Malonezone, a good friend of mine, Greek professor at Oakwood College, taught me, who he's an outstanding, outstanding photographer. He says, Henry, do not take the picture until you see in the lens exactly what you want to see. Do not utter the sentence until it says exactly what you want it to say. Do not be slovenly with words. Do not be careless with verbs. Do not be nonchalant about adjectives. Do not be so, so, so uninterested in the adverbs. Understand the function of a preposition. Be sure that your interjections pound the mind. Let verbs walk. Let nouns name. And do so like an artist, understanding exactly what your purpose is, because the old woman has just told me, Ellen White, she's just told me that if I will take my imagination and view the scenes, but you see, once I have viewed those scenes, once I have pictured them in my mind, then how do I convey those pictures to my congregation? For as a preacher, I must do more than possess the picture in my mind. I must now use the gift of gab, the gift of language, to make sure that they see exactly what I want them to see. How did she look, that woman caught in adultery? Did the robe caress a body that still showed evidence of desire? Were her lips pursed in fear or in desire as she was drugged before her Lord? Was the scene? What did the, can you smell their hatred and fear of Christ as they drug her before him? Can you see the compassion in his face? Can you see the fear on her face? Do you hear rocks dropping quietly from hands, thudding on the ground as embarrassed people tiptoed away? Can you tell me that picture? Are you bending over his shoulder as he writes in the dust? And are you thankful that he writes sins in the dust, but the law on the stone? Have mercy, Jesus. And can you convey that picture? The saints begin to draw out of their miasma of fear and self-deprecation and find hope in a Lord who stoops beside a weary and wicked and yet suffering woman and lifts her up and says to her, go and sin no more for I have no condemnation for you. How do you paint that picture? You paint it by becoming a master, a master, a master of human language. And you will work at it. And you will work at it. And you will work at it until it flows from your pen, from your computer, whatever your device for writing is, naturally, 
Well done. You will read good books until the language of great authors now is so impressed in the convolutions of your cerebral cortex that it pops out upon call. You will listen to great preachers until their way of expressing themselves becomes your way of expressing yourself. You will do this because often when you stand in the pulpit on Sabbath morning, you've got tired people and weary people and frustrated people and you don't have but a few minutes, maybe three or four minutes at the beginning of the sermon to catch their minds and pull them out of their lifestyle and present them before the cross. And so you cannot waste time in the introduction flim flamming around trying to figure out where you're going. You got to be at it instantly with the power of your words. And so this, uh, this quote from Desire of Ages, page 83, is an invitation, a challenge, and a guarantee for the preacher. It's a guarantee. She says, we shall be more deeply imbued with this spirit. It is an invitation to take a walk back through time, propelled by the mental ability to picture. The Holy Spirit says, you are welcome, and the Savior says he will assist us, but the Comforter, he writes, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. He's promising you that if you will work at it, if you will read and gather, then he will tap into you because you want to reach the point where as a minister, there's always way more in you than you can ever say. You must become pregnant with the word. Pregnant with scripture. Pregnant with language. That's your job. Remember I told you this morning, you are a professional. Do not be some, some slovenly, casual, you're a professional. The Sabbath school superintendent can stumble over words, but not you. You're a professional. You speak for a living. And you speak to the living. And a minister must be as good with his tongue and his words as the surgeon with the scaffold. As we will see this evening, he will learn to use even the most simplest things like the pause. And inflection. And other such tools as we'll talk about this evening that hold people. We're not talking about performing. We're talking about becoming a master preacher. Now having said that, I already told you this morning, you'll never be a master preacher, but you don't get to the sun by shooting at the moon. You shoot for the stars. I wish somebody would wake up this afternoon. You must always shoot higher than you'll ever go to get where you want to be. So you're always working to become a master preacher. And don't be, don't be so quick to write yourself off. I don't have a voice like so-and-so, and, and, and I don't have a sense of humor like so-and-so. Oh, that's bunk. The Holy Ghost called you. Do not put limits on yourself. The above quote Ellen White's quote, is a challenge to put to use a gift. The ability to paint on the fleshy video screen of the cerebral cortex in living color, sights, sounds, and even feelings, feelings is unmatched. You see, when I paint a scene on paper, first of all, I'm going to paint it with my senses. So when I talk about Christ on the cross, not only, Ray, do I want to see him, follow me now, I also want to hear him, I want to smell him, I want to touch the situation, taste the situation. Are you following me? So often I ask my students as they present a picture to me, what are you hearing, first of all? Everybody right now, close your eyes. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes. Terry with me. Close your eyes. You're at the cross. What do you hear? 
Shout it out, anybody. Your eyes are closed. What do you hear? Screams? Jeering? Cursing? Gambling? Crying? Do you hear breathing? Do you hear heavy breathing? Huh? Do you hear the clunk of hammers being practiced to drive nails through bones? So what do you hear? What do you smell? Come on, what do you smell? Sweat, yes. Smell death, yes. Huh? Urine, yes. Good, good. Men who are afraid often lose control. Yeah, yeah. Pictures. All right, open your eyes. Now, listen to me. So I never make a presentation or preach a sermon for the sake of entertainment. I'm always going after something. You have a gift. And until you learn to use that gift, you will not be a complete preacher. And you must learn to describe to the people what you see. Living on planet Earth is a rough experience. Some of you who have visited my church know that I do not spend time on Sabbath morning inside teaching a Sabbath school class. Mike, where am I on Sabbath morning? Reading the people as they come in. You know why I do that? I'm going to preach to them that day. I'm reading their faces as they come in church. I see sadness sometimes. I see pressure. I see anxiety. Sometimes as a husband and wife drive up, I watch how she gets out of the car. Does she slam the door? I'm serious, folk. Does she close it gently? Does she turn around and say, okay, precious, see you later? Or does she get out and go wham and keep on going? That tells me a lot about the morning in that home. I watch faces. Sometimes when they come up, they're uptight. Sometimes they smile. Sometimes as I grab their hand and hold it in mine and look them straight in the eye and say, how was the week? Tears begin to form immediately. And so by the time I stand up to preach on Sabbath morning, I got a feel. Are you listening to me? This thing is serious, folk. What we do is serious. And I say to young ministers all the time, if you're not up to this, find something else to do because this work is demanding and serious. The good preacher works harder than anybody. He's in his office every day. He has a schedule. He visits, he plans, he programs. He rises early in the morning to spend time with God. Why? Because he is dealing with something so precious that it drove God to the cross. Human beings. So when he preaches, he must have language that cuts through the feelings of that woman who shook, he shook hands with that morning, who formed, who, 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 whose eyes formed tears when he spoke to her. He must cut through that husband who, as he walked by, was going to walk by without shaking the pastor's hand. He just upset. And so he reached out and said, come on, brother, don't go by me like that. Give me your hand. All right, elder. All right. But his tone says he doesn't want to be there, but he's there. And you've got to have language. This is why in my church we have short preliminaries. Those who visit my church can tell you there's no parading and promenading in my pulpit. We come in with singing. We go right to the things that need to be done. And within 25 or 30 minutes, we're up with the word. Why? Because we're dealing with something very, very serious. And you've got all this competition. And the competition you have is the competition of life. 
you are working against life, life pressures, life issues, life incidents. They are your enemies when you stand up, and unless you have the kind of language and the kind of preparation that will cut through that, then you preach in vain. You must be able, based on the input of reading, to get close to the real scene as possible. You must not only see Jesus on the cross, but you must hear him moaning. You must sense the crowd spitting. You must be able to paint the Satan-inspired epitaphs from lips curled in anger's grip. You must see the blood forming rivers of sorrow around eyes so full of love and compassion to see flies buzzing with the vic vicious nuisance of unthinking insects around the open wounds of his back to almost feel what it would be like to have these spikes aimed at the center of your hand. How do spikes feel in the palm of a hand? But the statement that Ellen White makes is also a promise. It's a promise of enlarged capacity, a promise to the great preachers of old and of today to take literally, a promise that there will, be, there will come to the preacher an inspiration. Ellen White's words were, we shall be more deeply imbued with his spirit. She's saying that if you will use your imagination, the spirit can do something for you he otherwise will not do. Have you ever wondered why God gave all the creatures that he creates, at least that we know about, that are sentient beings in most cases, he gave them S-I-G-H-T, sight. What would life be without sight? God is a visual being. He likes pictures. And so when you're talking about somebody in your sermon who's walking through a garden, what does the garden look like? They haven't been there. Is it green? Is it red? What's the walk made of? What kind of flowers are by the edges? Take the time to create pictures. Studies have shown if you take the visual sensual test, which tests visualness, kinesthetic uh, activity, and audio uh, uh, gifts, that most human beings are visual. They are visual. They are visual. In commenting on Black preaching, in his context, Elder Bradford in his book, a book I highly recommend, Preaching to the Times, makes several comments that apply at this time. You heard me say this morning, I don't believe in this concept of black preaching, and I meant that in terms of believing that one group of people have more of a preaching gift than another. I don't buy that. But in the South, after the days of slavery, black preachers did take the time to develop a gift of expression. You want to know why? Their people, most of them, could not read. And if the old southern black preacher has got to jump on the rest of us, it's because out of necessity, they had to take the pictures of the Bible and paint them. And in that sense, there's something to learn from that idiom. Bradford writes, black preaching essentially is more the idiomatic expression or colorful phraseology. In its purest form, it is an approach to the supernatural, the mysterious. It is based on a concept of God as being all-powerful, wholly other, and always on the side of the oppressed and disenfranchised. They did make use of the whole range of sounds produced by the human voice in its attempt to recreate the biblical narrative to take the hearers back to the scene. And some of those things we smile about, the guttural sounds, the raising of the voice, the deep tones, the sometimes, the sometimes sudden shriek of the voice. This is not just someone trying to show off. This is a preacher preaching to people who mostly could not read and needed to bring them to the scene and used all the tools of speech and voice to do that. I want to talk to my Anglo brethren for a minute. Somewhere in the 50s and 60s, we got some idea in the Adventist church amongst our Anglo brethren that conversational preaching was the way to go. 
Fine. But how do people really conversate? With a rise and fall of the voice? See, I got a problem with a person who can go to a football game and say, Get him! Get him! Stop it! And then say, And Jesus went to the cross. There died for our sins. And we're deeply moved by his sacrifice. Come on, brethren. The first great preachers in the Adventist church were white men. And they preached. When Ellen White would hear old Loughborough, she always shouted when she heard Loughborough preach, you know. That was her favorite preacher. And John's voice began to rise up. And as the old woman would sit and hear him, as he got caught up in the spirit, Sister White would rise up. She often went into vision. Why, luck? Can you imagine preaching so that your saints go into vision? Come on, y'all. Yes, sir. The whole church gets caught up. Why? Because you're caught up. Now, all of us can preach with power and enthusiasm. Not for the sake, watch me now, not for the sake of emotionalism, but out of the natural emotion of what Christ has done for me. What do you say? Amen. Continuing Bradford's quote, but most of all, talking about black preaching, it seeks to relate to the needs and issues of the present. Black preaching, therefore, came to make full use of the imagination. Black preaching, therefore, came to make full use of the imagination. Preaching is more than rehearsing a lecture. Its use of information and facts is not sterile, but calculated to produce reaction and response. Now, let me pause on that. The key verb is calculated. Calculated to produce response. I want to stress that. I want to stress that. Ladies and gentlemen, we are Seventh-day Adventist preachers. We are preachers of the last day message. And we are seeking to move people to decision. Now, I'm just going to say a little brief word about something that people get nervous about. But I believe in making appeals. We baptize in our church every month. Not every other, every month. And when I get done with a sermon and I move down front, I'm looking for somebody to respond. Now, every Sabbath, it does not happen. It didn't happen yesterday. But I sure did make an appeal. But the Sabbath before that, seven folks stood up. Yes, sir. I'll let the Holy Ghost do the counting. I just do the work. <laughs> now, why do we appeal? It doesn't always have to result, my friend, in someone joining the church. But if you have prepared and worked and developed and are informed, have done your homework, have built your, your whole theme in your sermon, and you have something meaningful to say, at least call them to prayer. Or more study, or be a better parent, or love the Lord more, get the knees used to doing something. We preach with a purpose. We preach to draw, to bring to conviction, and to bring to decision. What do you say? Now, it's not my intent, as I talked for a few minutes about, white, about black preaching, to set one kind of preaching over against another. I'm just talking about the fact that a particular group of people, out of necessity, developed a particular group, a particular gift. Desire of Ages 254. If you've never read it, 
I'd like to recommend that you find the book Desire of Ages, go to page 253, 254, and read Ellen White's only thorough description of Christ's preaching style. It is absolutely marvelous. She spends about 10 paragraphs working from page 253 to 255 describing the preaching method of Jesus. It is worth every minute. Desire of Ages. I'm going to read you just one paragraph from that description. He has the tact to reach the prejudiced minds, she's writing, and surprise them with illustrations that won their attention. And then the key sentence. Through the imagination, he reached their heart. Page 254. So Jesus was an imagination preacher. Because most of the folk he preached to couldn't read or write either. The Pharisees could quote Genesis 1 through Deuteronomy, the last chapter and the last verse from memory. But the common people did not have the scrolls. And so when this young, eloquent teacher came along, whose language was geared to the imagination, who brought them into the scenes, they said, never a man <laughs> spake like this man. Or they said in some cases, we've not heard it on this wise before. I, like to, I love that Bible phrase. Haven't heard it on this wise before. Or they said, what manner of teaching is this? <laughs> we can understand this fellow. Now as I pause, I want to be sure we're on target. If you look into the index of Ellen G. White's writings, you will find over 200 references about imagination. Now, many of those references are cautionary and negative. In fact, she goes on to say how Satan can use the imagination. There are even statements expressing how error can come, even saying that truth cannot be comprehended by imagination alone, and I agree with the old woman. In other words, if one researches Ellen White's counsel about the imagination in general and reads shallowly, one could leave with a very miscued view of how she feels about imagination. But a closer study shows that she lifts imagination as a gift above the ordinary. Let me share with you now some of her most potent statements, and you get these down somewhere and then look them up and read them. Child Guidance, page 507. Child Guidance, page 507. Now, this sentence just blows my mind. It just, listen to this. I mean, this lady is so practical. In the Bible, a boundless field of information is opened to the imagination. The student will come from a contemplation of its great grand themes. The student will come from association with its lofty imagery, more pure, and elevated in thought and feeling. See, when I read about Moses and the children of Israel at the Red Sea, then I close my Bible and do this. What do I see? See, how do the waves look lapping at the feet? Can I hear in the distance the thunder of horses' hooves? Can I smell anxiety? permeating the people, almost like AIDS, as they face water, can't be crossed, mountains, can't be climbed, desert, they've already covered, no place to go? Do I hear whimpering from women as they wonder what their children will do? Go there. Stand by the Red Sea. See a man with an old face but a young body climb up to the rocks where he can be seen. Raise his staff. Paint it in your mind. See, go there. And a lot of times what I do, when I do, when I finish, then I start writing. We call it, in sermon preparation, brooding. Child Guidance, page 507. I will. Not right now. 
But you must vision and see. You must vision and see. So she says, there's a boundless field for the imagination. Here's another one. Message to young people, 255. The Bible presents a boundless field for the imagination as much higher and more ennobling in character than the superficial creations of unsanctified intellect as the heavens are higher than the earth. The inspired history of our race is placed on the hands of every individual. Let them read it and picture it. Messages to Young People, page 255. Continuing, Child Guidance, page 488. The minds, speaking of our children, should be filled with the stories of the life of our Lord and their imaginations encouraged in picturing the glories of the world to come. Did you hear that? Now, it's amazing to me what happens. One of the most gifted people in the church are people who know how to tell children's stories. And you know how we do when we talk to children? We lose ourselves. And Jesus was walking beside the water. And the water was so blue, looking at their faces, and the sky was so blue, and the birds were there. Can you hear the birds? And their little faces nod. <laughs> Do you know what adults are? Big children. <laughs> we raise our voice, our face gets animated. And then Jesus said, Behold, the sower goes forth to sow. And we point, we point. And then we get up here for the adults and we stand stiff, don't move. Now the children are sitting there, they're wide awake, animated. And the big children. Are you listening to me, folk? I'm very serious. There's something wrong with that rationale. How do we get from here up here? What happened to the person that was down there, animated, alive, descriptive, interested? Maybe that person should come up here. Come on, y'all. Maybe that preacher needs to come up here. And then to adults say, as the sower went forth to sow, and then paint the scene, paint the Sea of Galilee, paint the clouds, paint the, paint, paint the sky, paint it. That adult to adults who need to picture what Christ has done. I keep reading. Seventh-day Adventist Bible Commentary, volume 6, page 1085. Ellen White. We are to educate our imagination. Now I can read on and on and on and on. Don't want to bore you. Have the things I want to do. Educate your imagination. The picture that is framed in this, our imagination, can be a tool for good. It can enliven, it can enliven the scriptures and can elevate our appreciation of the Bible stories. But we must use the gift responsibly, honestly, not as a substitute for real study and understanding the word of God. See, as you're painting a picture, you got the old saint sitting out there. So as you paint the picture, don't get so imaginative that you start describing things that they know really couldn't have happened. The Holy Ghost will let you fill in the gaps a little bit, but don't get carried away. Moses didn't run to the rock and shout at the people, come on, jump in the water. He didn't say no, no, no. The woman didn't get up after Christ forgave her and threw her arms around his neck and pressed herself against him and kissed him on the cheek. Now don't go there. So the old deacon, she can't handle that. Jesus kissed somebody. But you can fill in legitimate gaps. I'm very serious. My style can be humorous, but I'm very serious. 
My, my humor is my personality. But I'm very serious. I'm very serious this afternoon. This may be one of the most important things you'll ever hear about preaching. Because we are, in many cases, failing God here. And so when I teach preaching, I teach imagination and the use of it as an, inten as, as an intentional part of preaching. It's a gift I want to see you develop. Now, as some of my former students know, the way, as Terencio knows over there, bless your heart, the way that they are trained by me to use this gift is that all their sermons they present to me must be what, Terencio? Written out. Yeah. Isn't that right, Mike? Isn't that right? Write your sermon. Because it's in writing that you learn to use your language, whether it be Spanish, whether it be an oriental language, whatever, it's in writing. Then you begin to understand how verbs and nouns and adjectives and prepositions can help each other. Write, 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 write. And then you do two things, my brother. In case you get bored with the writing, understand that every time you write, you're actually recording an encounter with the Holy Ghost. Maybe I can get something out of them over here. When you write, you're recording an encounter with the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't let that moment slip by. Put it down. And then, because now we're blessed with computers, it means I don't have to do my homework over again. If I go back to a particular story, I can go right back there, pull it up out of that sermon, put it here, maybe add to it, save myself some time. So my sermons are a part of my library. Over a thousand manuscripts now in my library. It's hard work, Jones. It's hard work. That's why when you asked me today to send you a manuscript, I gotta pray on that one, brother. I don't <laughs> He's working on something and I'm gonna work with him too. He's doing a very fine project. Manuscripts, encounters with the Holy Ghost. Now I'm gonna say something, it's gonna sound maybe a little egotistical. But there are times, for my own encouragement, I will go back to my library and pick up an old sermon and read it. And let the Lord, through Henry, speak to Henry. It's very humbling to preach to yourself and be fed. And sometimes when I do that, young man, I'm reminded that in that moment of encounter, it was not me, it was God. Because when I read the words of my own sermons, I say, that could not have come from me. It's too good. <laughs> what is imagination? Webster says, it is the act or power of forming mental images of what is not actually present. Let me repeat that, my friend. It is the act or power of forming mental images of what is not actually present. That's your challenge in church. Now, we've got to be careful, folk, in these last days. We are encumbering church with too much stuff. In your liturgies, learn to get those announcements and all those things out of the way before church starts. We're weighing the people down with PR and promotion. Folk are tired. They've worked all week. You're struggling with self. Let every song, every scripture, everything that happens in the service lead toward the sermon. And then get up, read your text, and get to business. None of this, well, saints, this week was a hard week, and the devil's been all over me. We already know that. You live on planet Earth. It was a hard week. Yes. Preach me a sermon. It is the power, it is the act or power of forming mental images of what is not actually present. Therefore, as it relates to preaching, imagination is a hallway, a time capsule 
that allows me to assist the hearers in grasping the events of the Bible. Ellen White's statements, read, I read earlier, where she invites you and me to contemplate the biblical scenes and then share is an endorsement and an encouragement to the preacher. Now, how do we make it work? Follow me carefully. What's the purpose of a noun? It identifies. Nouns identify. Now when you're developing a sentence in your manuscript, and by the way, all my sermons I preach are written out. And many people over the years think I don't preach with notes. I've been given a gift by God. Once I write it, I remember it. But if you hear me preach a sermon, it's been written out. I believe more in the writing than my speaking. And one of the things I pause on are nouns. Because is that the noun? Is that the noun? If it's the name of a person, does the name need some help? If it's the name of a place, is that a place they know? Well, I need to help that become identifiable in their minds. Who am I preaching to? Children, if I say Jericho, will they know what Jericho is, what it means? Will the noun need help? But nouns in a sentence that don't bring a picture are a waste of the people's time. The second part of speech that we use Can you read it? What does that say? Pronouns. Pronouns. What's the function of a pronoun? He says substitute for a noun. More than that, it helps identify a noun. See, is, is Sam a he or a she? Are we talking about an it or a person? So pronouns are very important in clarifying. See, a lot of times what I do is after I get done writing something, then I will take that, find my son. Now, my son has his father's personality. He is a melancholic choleric. I'm a choleric melancholic. And so my youngest son is very critical. And he has no problem saying, now, Dad, I don't think that makes any sense at all. He's young. He's my son. Sometimes I want to bop him upside the head, but a lot of times he's right. So if he is turned off, say, okay, that's going to affect the most critical people. They won't like that. My wife's a phlegmatic. The hardest people to preach to are phlegmatics. They're laid back, come see, come saw, have no real emotion about anything. If you get a phlegmatic to shout, you know you're almost in heaven. because they, they <laughs> <laughs> You know, my dad's a phlegmatic. And my dad's the kind of person, if you, if you, if you said, if you said, if, if, if an atom bomb exploded in the field across from dad's house, he'd get up, go to the window. Hey, son, I think that was an A-bomb over there that just, ex <laughs> you've got all this in your congregation, don't you? The sanguines who shout easily, thank God for sanguines. Because for the sanguine, I don't care how bad your sermon is. Oh, yeah. You preached. Because the sanguine was just happy to be alive. And all the sanguine knows is, you use the Bible, and you have some texts. And every now and then you got loud, and they're going to walk out and say, whoo, the pastor preached today. Now, don't ask the sanguine what you said. You asked the melancholic what you said. So the pronouns, how did I get off on that? So the pronouns, let's keep going. This all has purpose. Adjectives. What's the function of an adjective? To describe what? Nouns. To describe nouns. I'm setting you up for an exercise. Stay with me. Stay with me. 
Then we have, what's that? Verbs. The function of a verb. To describe action. One of the most vital parts of speech and tools that you have. And then, of course, the verbs are helped by what? Okay. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Let's try something. Peter denied Christ. Simple sentence. Peter denied Christ. Now, first of all, to the average Christian, that's a boring sentence. He knows who Peter is. He knows who Christ is. And he's heard 50,000 times in his life that Peter denied Christ. You've added nothing to his thought process. So for this event, this incident to have meaning, you have some work to do. Let's first of all look at the noun, Peter. Help me with Peter. What do you want to convey about Peter than more than the fact that he is Peter? Give me one word. All right, brash Peter. Fearful Peter, impetuous Peter, anxious Peter, cowardly Peter. Now, something's beginning to happen. Something is beginning to happen for the listener. Because now they're drawn in. They know what it is to be cowardly themselves. They know what it is to be anxious, impetuous. Now Peter's taking on flesh and bone. It's not just a name, it's a person. It's a cowardly person. It's an afraid person. It's a nervous person. Denied. The verb needs help. Openly denied. Okay, I'll take that. Repeatedly denied. Thank you, my brother. Keep going. Hmm? Vehemently. Brother's getting deep now. Vehemently. Some of the old saints are going to say, what is that? But I know he did it. <laughs> That's all right. Educate him. Vehemently. Yeah. A lot of folks I've preached in Mississippi wouldn't know what that was, but they know he did something bad. Because <laughs> they know denying is bad. See what I'm saying? See? Vehemently. I like that. Vehemently. Uh, repeatedly. Yeah. See, you, you've got to help. You've got to help it. And when you're writing this, don't just write it. Look at it. Is that the picture? You've got the camera. You're there. You're taking them there. Did you catch it the way you wanted to catch it? Did he nervously deny? With oaths denied? Yeah. You've got to add. Now, Christ. Come on. We know who Christ is. But paint Christ in this situation. Sorrowful. Sorrowful Christ. The suffering Christ. Weary Christ. Deserted Christ. Tired Christ. Disappointed Christ. Okay, okay, okay. So when you get done, when you get done doing your homework, a three word sentence can become a picture in somebody's mind of the scene. And it's your responsibility, young man, yours, to do this work. It's yours, sir, to do this work in that oriental tongue, to paint the pictures. You must do it patiently because I don't care what language we come from what culture we grow up in we have an imagination this is what I'm talking about this is what I want you to learn to do besides the verbs and the nouns and the adverbs 
and the adjectives. You have prepositions. What's the function of a preposition? To show relationships. Conjunctions. What's the function? To continue action. Interjections. What's the function? To show surprise. You gave all the right answers. Now, in the English, these are your tools. Some languages will vary. And what this lecture is about is, I don't want you from this point forward to ever sit down and write a sermon and not think about this. Was that the best verb to use? Did he deny or did he defame? Which gives the best picture? Did he deny or did he abandon? What gives the best picture? Because you've got one shot at that tired brain. And I want you to learn to think about this. I want our sermons to become artworks of our language. This is your responsibility. And I, with you, am still learning. You have figures of speech personifications, metaphors, similes, and all we can go. And then you have to paint pictures, illustrations. Illustrations help to paint pictures. And the main thing about illustrations, for them to paint the right pictures, first of all, they must be true, don't tell lies in the pulpit. You know, I have gone through some very embarrassing experiences, you know, sitting sitting and, and because, you know, my reputation's kind of gotten around and then I go places and people are preaching and maybe they get in their head they need to maybe make an impression or something. And, and, and I, re, I was in a church about a year ago. Brother was telling a story. And, you know, you're just wincing inside. Your brain says there's no way in the world that happened. If you're going to tell an illustration, tell the truth. Want a good source of illustrations? I've used it for 36 years. Can't beat it. Reader's Digest. Every Reader's Digest has a true life experience from somebody. Real, I mean dramatic stories. And they're all true. Now when you tell illustrations, I want you to take some notes real quick. Don't tell too many, point number one. You don't have to illustrate everything. People can think. <laughs> you've heard and you've read illustrations are windows. No house is built of windows. Don't go from one story to another, folk. Preach the gospel, add a story. Don't tell too many. Number two, you must know how to tell the illustration. Now, brethren and sisters, you can read to me from your sermon notes. You can read to me from the Bible. Do not read to me an illustration. Tell it. Tell the illustration. And telling illustrations will allow you to practice this thing we've been talking about called imagination. Do you see it? Next. You must see your illustration. See it. Next, you must feel your illustration. Feel it. Yes, sir. Oh, man. You must feel it. Next, shorten your illustration. Have you ever heard a sermon where the illustration goes on so long, you forget what he's illustrating? And unfortunately, so does he. Next, you must master your illustration. And last, if it's a good illustration, 
Use it again. You can repeat it. See, one of the things I like about being 59 years old, so you get to be this age, if you tell a good illustration that you've heard before, they quit to forgive you. Well, pastor's old now. He told that to us two months ago, but that's all right. It's still a good illustration. Yeah. When you're young, you can't get by with that. We expect you to have something fresh to say every time, but we old guys, we can tell illustrations over and over again. My point is, if it's a good illustration, use it more than once. Now, follow me. Follow me. Why do we use illustrations with the Bible? Isn't the Bible a book of stories? Isn't it? So why do we use illustrations with the Bible? Drive home the point. Ah, that's it. That's it. The reason why we use illustrations with the Bible, which is nothing but a story itself, is that we're trying to bring the Bible story up to now. We're trying to relate it to now. Let me read you a statement. Ellen White is commenting on this text. The text says, But with many such parables spake he the word unto them, as they were able to bear it, but without a parable spake he not unto them. Mark 4, 33 and 34. Christ's object lessons. She says, Christ's use of parables was a representation of his understanding of the human mind. When he told stories, related to their experience, their environment, and their culture. He was making the truth for their time, scratch, he was making the truth for another time, real to their time. The use of imagination. It must have been in 1969 that they told me I had an incurable lung disease. I live with bolus emphysema. This lung is not worth a dime. This lung does all the work. This lung is held together with polyethylene this lung is held together with God, human flesh. I had one son and a precious wife. And after going in and working on me for eight hours and peeling off all of the boli, Latin for blister, draining away the fluid, they sewed me up and said, you need to find another profession. They asked me, what do you do for a living? I'm a minister. What are your degrees? Well, I have a BA in religion from Oakwood College have a minor in biblical languages, Hebrew and Greek. Doctor shook his, the doctor shook his head, said, well, you have any other degrees? Well, I have a master's from Andrews University. What is that in? Systematic theology. What is your minor in? Old and New Testament. <laughs> doctor shook his head. He said, you don't know how to do anything else, do you? I said, no, sir. This is my life. Follow me. I'm going somewhere with this. So I kept on preaching. They said, well, by the time you're 40, you probably will not be able to preach at all. Breathing will be difficult. 
But it's up to you, young pastor, what you decide to do. I kept on preaching. I began to read Ellen White. Brethren, we have a gift. Sisters, we have a gift. She talks about preaching from the diaphragm. That's where I get my resonance from. Not from here, from here. The diaphragm, expanded when you preach, boosts the lungs and increases power. She talks about learning to keep your vocal cords warm and moist. And so before I stand up and preach, I drink something warm to preheat my vocal cords. And when I get done this afternoon, I will drink something a little cooler to deheat my vocal cords so I can preach and preach and preach and preach and never get hoarse. I've learned before I stand up to preach, to go back there in the back or find myself a place before I walk in here and go down like this and count to 10 and then and that keeps your resonance. Do that 10 times, by the way. Then I started taking tests over the years. The lungs got stronger and stronger and stronger. Now when I take tests, pulmonary function tests, for I found out that the lungs, when opened up, will cover a tennis court. And most of us don't use but 80 or 90% of their lung power. But I use 117% on a scale of lung power. I use full lung power. I measure more lung power than people with two lungs. I asked the doctor, how has this happened? He said, well, it appears, Reverend, he calls me Reverend, sounds good, he calls me Reverend. <laughs> he says, Reverend, it appears that your speaking has strengthened your lungs. The very thing that appeared to be against me is the very thing God used for me. Do not for a minute, as a preacher, limit your gifts. You, in God's hand, can paint pictures, can tell stories, can enliven the Word of God with eloquence, with incisiveness, with professionalism, in such a way that people wonder how you do it. Not because of any natural ability you have, as I do not have natural lung ability, but because you have so given yourself to the work and the art and the determination and the goal and the purpose to do it right that God adds to your effort. And so every time I stand up and preach, and these lungs bottle forth. I do not give myself credit. I know there's a God in heaven who can take one-fourth of a lung, let alone one lung. In fact, he said, I will take something with no lungs if necessary. Rocks will cry out and preach the gospel. What God needs is a willing person, a willing heart, a willing mind. And do not ever say to yourself, you can't, just say God win. God bless you. See you this afternoon.